All right, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly City Seminar Series. Today we're uh, very, very uh, happy to be joined by uh, Michael Peskin, who's come to us from Stanford University. Uh, Michael uh, did his AB at Harvard and then in chemistry and physics, uh, and then a PhD at Cornell uh, in physics. Uh, after uh, his time at Cornell, he was a visiting scientist at the Institut de Physique Theorique in Saclay, France. And uh, he came back uh, to the U.S. as an associate professor at uh, Cornell. Uh, that was before he uh, joined uh, Slack in 1982, and uh, in 1986 he was a full professor at, at Slack. He was the head of the Slack uh, theoretical group in 2001 to 2010. Um, Michael is a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's a fellow of the uh, AAAS and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Michael uh, is the, is the uh, author of the book, The Introduction to, An Introduction to Quantum Field Theory with Dan Schroeder, uh, and he has his name on more than 112 published articles in the field of theoretical physics. Uh, Michael is a strong advocate of uh, linear colliders, and uh, uh, as you'll hear today, he is, he's intimately involved in uh, what's going on now uh, at CERN. Uh, so, if you'll uh, join me in welcoming Michael. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I am a fan of linear colliders, but today we're going to talk about one that's not linear. So, please excuse me. Um, so, what we are going to talk about today is the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland at the Laboratory CERN. It's a, a very impressive thing. It's the world's largest scientific instrument, also the world's most expensive scientific instrument. Um, the purpose of the Large Hadron Collider is to go down to small distances, to study distances potentially uh, 10 to the minus 18 centimeters or smaller, um, 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than an atomic nucleus. And so what I'd like to do is to tell you a little about what's supposed to be there and um, how we're going to get it out. Um, I should say that this colloquium, some of you are from SETI, some of you are from the general public. Um, this is going to be a little more technical than your usual public lecture, but uh, Adrian assures me that that's okay. But if it's not okay, uh, please come afterward and I'll answer any questions you might have. Okay, um, when I talk about the LHC, I think before we talk about the science, we have to talk about um, big science, the uh, LHC on the scale of enormous scientific projects. This is a very impressive picture, at least to me, that was taken on the LHC first beam day. And what it shows are the five directors general of CERN who presided over the design and construction of the LHC accelerator. So this is a 25-year time span. Um, it's something that demands a, a, just an incredible level of institutional continuity to say we're going to do something and then 25 years later get the results. And this is not something where you have a small team that puts it in orbit and waits. This is a, a global collaboration involving tens of thousands of people. So it's just a, a tremendous um, uh, achievement um, and really unparalleled in big science to make this happen. And so the next question is, well, what makes it worth it? So now let's explain that. So in elementary particle physics, the, the, the original mission was to find out what was going on inside the atomic nucleus. We have the strong interactions we have which bind the nucleus together. We have the weak interactions which m mediate radioactive decay processes. Um, in the 1950s, both of these were a mystery, and people wanted to understand what that mystery was about. Um, right now, we believe that both the strong and the weak interactions are solved problems. 
And in fact, we can present very accurate data that tells you the structure of the fundamental interactions that underlies both of those interactions. And actually, I'm going to show you a little of that in the first part of this talk. Of course, in science, whenever you solve one problem, there's another one lurking beneath it. Or in this case, actually several more. And so the first thing I'd like to do is to explain to you what those problems are. In the process, I'll tell you a little about what, um, how you do elementary particle physics. Uh, elementary particle physics, um, of course, involves huge data sets, but in some sense, it's very visual. We take pictures of elementary particle events, and we try to interpret them. And so I'd like to show you some events and their interpretations, just to give some orientation before we go to the LHC. So the other thing, of course, that, that I've already emphasized is that we have a lot of knowledge already about the properties of elementary particles. And in particular, we talk about something called the standard model. Um, the standard model, you've all heard about it. There are leptons, electrons, muons, and actually a heavy one called the tau. There are neutrinos. There are quarks, the things that are inside the proton. There are a specific set of um, bosons. Um, the photon is one. Then uh, heavy ones, W plus, W minus, and Z, and a light one called the gluon. These all obey, we believe, very similar equations of motion. And these are the things that act to produce the basic forces of subnuclear physics. Electromagnetism, the weak interactions, and the strong interaction. Um, that theory was made by many people, but in particular by the three people who were shown on this slide, Sheldon Glashow, Abdus Salam, and Steven Weinberg. And on this slide, they're looking very smug. And um, there's a good reason for that, because they're about to get the Nobel Prize in physics in 1979 for putting forward the correct theory of the weak interactions. Now, Salam, unfortunately, is no longer with us. But I've talked to Glashow and Weinberg recently. And Frankly, they're still looking very smug. Because <laughs> in the intervening 30 years, we haven't been able to overturn this theory and find out what's beneath it. We've done increasingly precise experiments. And this theory seems to hold up extremely well. So let me tell you a little about those experiments. So this is a, a kind of canonical elementary particle, modern elementary particle detector. This is a detector built by my colleagues at SLAC in the 1990s to observe um, the decays of that thing that appeared on the previous slide, the Z boson, which is one of the basic quanta of weak interactions. Um, let's just get a little idea of how this is made. You have um, colliding beams. An electron beam comes in along this axis. A positron beam comes in along that axis. They're going at the speed of light. The speed of light is a foot per nanosecond. So if you can do picosecond timing, you can arrange that those beams intersect at a very precise point. Around that point, you put layers of material that does different jobs in terms of imaging the material. So in the middle, there's, you see a very small red thing that I'll tell you about a little later. Around that, a chamber filled with gas that basically makes the images of the tracks of charged particles. Around that, a device called a calorimeter, which um, basically totally absorbs gamma rays and other electromagnetically interacting things, electrons, for example, and gives you their energy. And outside of that, in yellow, uh, what's called a hadron calorimeter, which does the same thing for nuclear particles, pions, kaons, protons. Um, the only things that get through the whole thing are muons, the extremely penetrating particles that are like heavy versions of the electron. And so by putting all of that together, you get a more or less complete picture of what happened in that event. And then you try and use a very large number of these pictures to figure out precisely what the laws are that create these events. Um, by the way, um, that's a person, or over here, so this thing is, sits in a four-story deep pit on the site at SLAC. Um, there are similar ones that were built at, at CERN in Geneva at the same time. Here's a, a typical picture that's taken by that device. So what you see are um, the tracks of charged particles. 
Um, this thing is immersed in a magnetic field that would cause those particles to bend. So to the extent that the tracks are very straight, it means that it's a very high energy particle. Then this, these histograms here give you the signal from the electromagnetic calorimeter. So these are electrons uh, giving a large electromagnetic signal. And so you can put it together. This is an electron and a positron that come together, make a Z boson. It decays back to an electron and a positron. And then you've measured the trajectories of the things that go out very precisely. Um, this is, there's another splash of energy here. Maybe one of them radiated a photon on the way out. Okay. Here is the heavy of, heaviest of the three leptons, the so-called tau lepton. Um, the picture looks very similar, a very straight track. You can see these tracks are bending here. So they're at lower momentum. Uh, on the one hand, a tau that decays to a uh, probably an electron and some neutrinos going in this direction. On the other side, a tau decaying to three pions, which are making signals both in the electromagnetic and the hadron calorimeter. This one track against three track topology is very characteristic of taus. And so it's one of the mnemonics for finding the heavy lepton in a big sample of more ordinary leptons. The thing I didn't show you yet, is what quarks look like. In these experiments, you capture the Z boson, you let it decay. Some of the time, the Z boson will decay to a quark and an antiquark. So quarks, um, we've never seen them in isolation. They're always bound up in protons, neutrons, pions, some kind of strongly interacting particle. So you might wonder what a Z decay to a quark and an antiquark would look like. And a typical one is shown on the next slide. Um, it's interesting that there are two collimated bundles of tracks, one over here and one over here. <coughs> and I'll show you some evidence in a moment that the directions of those bundles represent the directions of the original quarks. The, the interpretation is that as the quark zooms out away, once it's produced, it then is a radiator. It radiates these things called gluons, which are the, the particles that create the force that bind the quarks together. The gluons radiate more gluons. Eventually, everything turns into a very large number of quark and antiquark pairs. Those guys pair up, and they make pi mesons. That's the lowest energy state of a quark and an antiquark. And then eventually, what you get is a stream of pi mesons. The original process that produced the quark gave the quark a very large momentum. The radiation processes all involve small changes in momentum. So something going along will split into two things that are roughly going in the same direction, and so on. And so what you get is a very large number of particles, but all going in the same direction and basically dividing up the original impulse that you gave to that quark. Um, and you see. In, in these experiments, a very large number of events that look like that. Um, one very interesting thing is that you can ask, uh, what is the systematics for the direction of these um, impulses? L let me now give these things their, the name that we call them in particle physics. We call these jets. So when you see a jet, something that looks like that, that's a quark or a gluon that was spit out of a very energetic elementary particle reaction. If you, uh, well, what can I say? Open up my textbook and you ask, what is the angular distribution of quarks that are produced in the decay of a Z boson in the simplest approximation? Um, it's a very simple mathematical function, one plus cosine squared theta, a function that um, looks like this. If you measure the orientations of those jets with respect to the beam axis, you find one plus cosine squared theta. So in fact, however complicated is the process that makes the jets, if you interpret them as the way you visualize quarks, you get more or less the right prediction for how they're lined up with respect to the beam. Every once in a while, you see an event that looks like this. So this is now an event with three jets, one, two, three. This one over here is probably a gluon 
that was radiated from one of the quarks at a very early stage. And in fact, if you make that interpretation, you can ask what's the angular and energy distribution of gluons? It turns out to be exactly the same as the angular and energy distribution of photons that would be created if you made a, an electron-positron pair. Those things would radiate photons as they go out. That's one of the pieces of evidence that the gluon is a particle of spin one with polarization like the photon, obeying equations very similar to Maxwell's equations. If you study these processes in more detail, you come more and more strongly to that conclusion. <coughs> um, there's one more thing, kind of event I wanted to show you, and that's this one. This is, well now you would say, obviously a two-jet event where the Z is decaying to two quarks, one of which made this jet, the other one made that jet. But there's an extra feature to this event, which is given by the red spots in the middle. So right around the beam axis, just uh, really maybe 10 centimeters away from the beam axis, there's a can that holds little CCD chips. And those chips are such that if a charged particle passes through one pixel, it'll deposit some ionization in that pixel. So in this way, you can actually make a three-dimensional image of the tracks, a very precise one, as they emerge from the elementary particle interaction. If you blow up that picture, remember, we're talking about a detector that's four stories high, but it's in instrumented in such a way that you can get these track positions to tens of microns. What you find is that the tracks in that previous picture come from three different places. Some of them from here, where the electron and positron collided, some of them from here, and some of them from here. So that means that something was created here that flew over to here and then decayed, and presumably its antiparticle flew over to here in the opposite direction and decayed there. There's a known particle that does that. It's called the B meson, the analog of the pion containing the heaviest um, well, the next heaviest kind of quark called the bottom quark. A B meson has a lifetime of one and a half picoseconds. But again, at the speed of light, one and a half picoseconds is a whole millimeter. And if you have Einstein time dilation, it'll live longer. So these energetic B mesons live a fraction of a centimeter, and that's the distance between here and here. So by identifying these what we call secondary vertices, one can identify specific types of quarks, not just any quark, but some specific quark appeared in that event. And so now I've told you how to diagnose all these things, the presence of electrons, muons, the heavy lepton tau, ordinary quarks, and heavy quarks. And now maybe we have some equipment to start talking about um, physics, how you would get knowledge about physics from these events. Now, there's one more thing I should tell you about the weak interactions, which is that they have a very odd property, that the weak interactions prefer to couple to things that are spinning in the left-handed direction. It's, so an electron is a, a state of spin a half. It, that means that it has two spin states. If you have an electron in motion, there's a quantum state where the uh, spin is pointed, maybe I should use my right hand, along the beam direction or opposite to the beam direction. We call those, uh, the, if you like, the right-handed direction of spin and the other one is the left-handed direction of spin. If you take ordinary beta decay, some unstable nuclei, and you polarization analyze the electrons that come out, you can find out which way they're spinning it turns out that the closer the electrons are going to the speed of light, the more energetic they are, the higher the probability that they're spinning in the left-handed direction. And so this is the speed V over C. This is the probability of spinning in the left-handed direction. It goes to one when the electrons are very energetic. It's a very strange thing, and I'll make it a little stranger in a moment. But the standard model actually explains this, and it explains it in a very strange way. It says, first of all, we should start from a situation where electrons, muons, quarks all have zero mass. A zero mass particle 
is characterized more or less only by its spin. It, it doesn't have any mass, it goes at the speed of light, but if it's a fermion, like an electron or a muon, it will be spinning, and it can be spinning either in the left-handed or the right-handed direction. So in the standard model, the weak interactions couple only to the left-handed guys. They do not couple to the right-handed guys. The Z boson makes a little exception. It has a different coupling to left and right-handed particles given by this formula here, where this is only there for left-handed particles. This is actually the electric charge, and SW squared is a parameter of the model, very well measured to be close to 0.21. Um, these numbers being different for left and right-handed quarks, there's a different production rate in Z decays. And so the standard model makes this interesting prediction that for leptons, about 15% more of the time they're spinning left-handed. For quarks, it's almost maximal, 94% uh, for bottom type quarks. And it turns out that these predictions can be tested rather precisely. Um, first of all, if you take electrons and positrons and you annihilate them and make a Z, um, that uh, causes a resonance in the cross-section. The cross-section actually goes up by about a factor of 1,000. The width of that resonance by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle between energy and time gives you the lifetime of the Z or the strength of its couplings. It's equal to the sums of the squares of all of these numbers times some known factor. Uh, what this slide shows is the agreement of that prediction with experimental data. And as you can see from the slide, it's quite spectacular. The black line is the prediction of the standard model. The only free parameter in that calculation is the position of the resonance, the mc squared of the z boson. The points show the cross-section measurement. Uh, people who are very close to the screen can see that there are error bars on those points. And uh, all in all, you have a fraction of a percent agreement between theory and experiment. But even more impressive than that, one can actually have measurements that are sensitive to the spin direction of various particles that come out of the Z. Uh, one way to do that is with the heavy lepton. The heavy lepton decays to a neutrino. Neutrinos are spinning particles. And by looking at the other particles that are left over, neutrinos are basically invisible to these experiments, um, you can actually see patterns that are associated with the spin direction. So a left-handed spinning tau will decay to a slow pion, according to this curve. A right-handed spinning tau decays to a fast pion, according to this distribution. The black are the measured points, and you can see that there are more slow pions than fast pions indicating this 15% predominance of left over right. For bottom quarks, um, one can do the experiment, uh, my colleagues did at Slack, by starting creating the Z with left-handed polarized electrons. If you do that, the left-handed bottom quarks go forward, the right-handed bottom quarks go backward. If there's an asymmetry forward to backward in these distributions, it means that there is a spin asymmetry in the decay. And as you see, these are by no means symmetrical distributions. Actually, you sometimes confused about which is the bottom quark and the anti-quark. And when you take that out, you verify the prediction of the standard model to high accuracy. So it really does seem to be true that the charge with which the Z couples to electrons, muons, taus, quarks, depends on um, which, what kind of a spin that particle has. But this is a, an extremely weird thing because there's another way of thinking that this shouldn't matter at all. That way of thinking is, is shown on this slide. If I have a spinning particle and I insist that my theory is invariant under relativity, that means I can look at that particle in any frame. In this frame, it's a right-handed spinning particle. If I ran very fast, I would see it like this. Now it would be at rest, it would still be spinning in the same direction. If I ran even faster, the particle would look like this, and now it's apparently, it's still spinning in that direction, but it's moving this way, 
So now it's a left-handed spinning particle. So what happened? Well, before I said that you had ideally a theory where particles had charges which were associated with their spin. And that's possible if something's moving at the speed of light. But if something has a mass, it's no longer possible, as this argument shows. In fact, the way in the Dirac equation that you give something a mass is that you mix up the massless left and right-handed spinning quantum states. So what we've got is a situation where roughly this guy and this guy have different charges coupling to something that's very much like the photon called the Z boson. But nevertheless, they mix with each other. So whatever selection is given by these charges or whatever quantum number is supposed to be represented by those charges, it's not a good quantum number in nature. That symmetry is actually broken in nature. And in a similar way, um, by a somewhat more complicated argument, it's forbidden to give mass to the W and Z bosons uh, by the fundamental equations unless you break their basic symmetry. Um, there's a good reason why Maxwell's equations imply that the photon mass is zero, and the photon mass, you know, is really, really zero. Um, the Compton wavelength of the photon is much larger than the radius of Jupiter. Um, for W and Z, the same argument applies. Unless you spontaneously break the symmetry, then you can give them mass. So how could this happen? Well, oof. Let me just skip through this, and I'll, I'll give you this in words. There is a known example where we have something that obeys Maxwell's equations that gets a mass. That happens in the theory of superconductivity. If you have a superconducting material and it becomes superconducting, it pushes out magnetic fields. The mechanism by which it pushes out magnetic fields is that the photon acquires a mass in that material. The ordering caused by the superconducting condensate affects the electric fields in that material. And that effect is exactly to give mass to the photon. What we're seeing here is that something, something in ordinary space that we're walking through every day, sits down in some direction, like the condensate in a superconductor affects the W and Z bosons and gives them mass. We don't know what that is. We have hardly any evidence at all for what that's even made out of. There is one thing that's out there, which is a proposal for doing this. It's, if you like, the simplest possible proposal. And that is that you just invent a field that does this. And you insist that its potential energy is such that it has an asymmetrical minimum. It's not very satisfying, but at least we can go forward with that. And if we could find some evidence for that field, we could try and explore further and find out what's really going on. So that field is called the Higgs field. Um, it, its property is that that field sits down in space. It gets a value. Proportional to that value, we have the mass of the W and Z bosons and also the mass of all the quarks and leptons. In fact, in the simplest theory, all particles couple to the, this Higgs field in proportion to their mass. We know how big Z is because the theory gives us a relation between that number V, the mass of the W boson, which is known to be 80 GeV, roughly 80 times the proton mass, and the coupling constant of the W in the weak interactions, which we've measured very precisely. So we know that the number here is 250 GeV. So something in the universe has a symmetry breaking, a potential energy with a mass scale of 250 GeV that's breaking the fundamental symmetry of the weak interactions and producing mass for all particles. We don't know what it is, but if we could maybe go to 250 GeV, then we could find out. And so that's, if you like, the first goal of the LHC program, to find out this missing piece of the theory of weak interactions. What is that about? Uh, maybe we can find out if we could go to those energies and see what particles exist there. 
And certainly the first part of that would be to find the quantum excitation of this Higgs field, which is the thing called the Higgs boson. So that's one side of the story. There is another side of the story, um, which has to do with the question of cosmic dark matter. <coughs> and I guess for this colloquium, you've probably had many colloquia about dark matter. But let me just give a few facts that connect it to the story. So you all know that dark matter is out there. Um, it's visible in a very large number of ways in astrophysics. Um, the story began in the 1930s when this fellow here, Fritz Wicke, studied this object, the Coma Cluster of Galaxies. He estimated the forces within the cluster by looking at the relative Doppler shifts of galaxies. He then um, used that to estimate the potential energy, or the, rather the gravitational energy that was holding the thing together. If you have gravitational energy, you can divide by Newton's constant and find out the mass. You can then count the stars, and you can see how that mass tallies with the stars. And it turns out that there was a factor of 400 discrepancy, that the stars give only 1 over 400 of the mass that was apparently holding this cluster of galaxy together. So since then, there have been, oh, maybe I should say, that 1 over 400 is a little of an exaggeration. Because as I guess those of you in here who, who are astronomers know, most of the mass in a cluster of galaxies is not in the galaxies. When a cluster of galaxies form, galaxies fall in from large distances. And they drag with them, or what falls in with them, is a huge amount of interstellar medium. Just hydrogen and helium gas. If you have a large gravitational potential well, those hydrogen and helium atoms are speeding around, colliding with each other, making x-rays. If you photograph a cluster with an x-ray telescope, like the Chandra telescope, you can visualize that. And so here is a picture of a rich cluster of galaxies in the visible, in the optical. And then here is the same cluster of galaxies that Chandra x-ray telescope picture. So there are galaxies, which are a very small fraction of the mass of the cluster. There's gas, which it turns out is 20% roughly of the mass that you need. But then there's still something left over, something very weakly interacting, something that does not shine light. It's dark stuff, and it makes up the other 80% of what you need to give the correct mass count for those galaxies. Now, nowadays we have several ways of making these mass estimates for galaxies. Um, one of the best ways is by using uh, gravitational lensing. You have a, here a foreground galaxy. Um, this is some work done by Tony Tyson and his collaborators at UC Davis. Um, you see a blue thing over here. And this is a, actually a very beautiful and unusual picture. There are lots of blue things. There's one here. There's a blue image here. There's a blue image here. Um, what this group of people suggested is that those blue objects are actually all the same galaxy. There's some galaxy which is behind this at a sufficiently large redshift that Lyman alpha is redshifted into the blue. That's why it's seen as blue. The light is coming through a mass distribution. <coughs> And like a water droplet, the mass distribution bends the light and in fact forms multiple images of that galaxy. And by analyzing a picture like this, you can go back and make not only the total mass of the galaxy, but also the mass distribution. So recently, there have been some objects found which are very unusual from that point of view. Um, here's one of them. Um, Here's a cluster of galaxies. And actually, here, there's another cluster of galaxies. If you blow up each of those clusters, you see blue spots. And so we can analyze the mass distribution in this whole object by using gravitational lensing. You can also have the Chandra telescope take a picture of this thing. And so on the next slide, what I'll show you is the X-ray image and the inferred mass distribution superposed. So here's what it looks like. Um, the red are the mass contours. <laughs> the yellow are the x-ray contours. If you make them a false color picture, this is where the atoms are. 
The galaxies, remember, have negligible mass in this. The atoms, the gas, are here. The mass is here. We know what this is made of. That's hydrogen and helium. But what this is made of, we actually have no clue. And as an elementary particle physicist, I must say this is almost an insult. Because you can prove that there's no particle that you've yet made in an accelerator that would be consistent with the properties of the stuff that makes up the mass out here. So that's the dark matter. We'd really like to know what it is. There are many, many ways of looking for dark matter. But there's something about dark matter which is very suggestive. Um, it's, it's not necessary. But it's a very interesting argument, and it's spelled out on this slide. Um, a very natural idea about dark matter is that when the universe, early in the history of the universe, when the universe was hot, um, things could collide. You could make particles of any mass you wanted by colliding quarks and antiquarks, electrons and positrons, photons with other photons. If particles were created at that time, they would be in thermal equilibrium. And then you would have a, an initial condition. Then as the universe expanded, the universe cooled down, all these particles would run away from each other. If you had something that was heavy, stable, and weakly interacting, um, something that couldn't annihilate except when it found its antiparticle, that would have the following evolution. That for a while, they would annihilate like crazy. But then as the universe got large, and these things were very far separated from each other, it would be hard to find their partners. And some fraction of them would be left around. They'd still be annihilating very slowly. But there would be some of them left over today. It's a kind of uh, you know, first year graduate physics calculation to figure out how much of those things are left over. And they're described by the equation that I've written on this slide. So the ingredients here are the current amount of dark matter in the universe as a fraction of the whole energy budget of the universe. So this is 20%, uh, it turns out. The entropy density of the universe, which is dominated by the cosmic microwave background. We know exactly what that is. The closure density of the universe, given by the Hubble constant. The Planck mass, some numbers of order one. And there's one more thing that you have to know, which is the ability of these particles and antiparticles to annihilate one another, given by an, an annihilation cross-section. We know all the numbers except for that, so we can solve for that. And the answer, in some units that may not be totally apparent to you, is one picobarn. A barn is a typical nuclear cross-section. A picobarn is 10 to the minus 12 of that. To put it into some term that maybe we can deal with, let me take this cross-section and let me write it in terms of the fine structure constant, which is also the typical strength of weak interactions, uh, Planck's constant, and the mass of some particle that would be exchanged in the annihilation reaction. And if you just put this number in here and ask what the mass is, it's 200 GeV. So this is something that I must say I really find quite amazing that I gave you a set of arguments that had to do with the structure of the weak interactions, and it came to a number of 250 GeV. I gave you another set of arguments that just had to do with astrophysics, and we got the same number. It's you know, two within orders of magnitude. But there seem to be some reasons why this is an interesting energy to go to. And if we could go there, maybe there are some particles there which would give us new insights about one or another of these problems, and maybe even more insights about the fundamental interactions of the universe. So now we have to go there and see what's there. So now we need the strategy to do that. So basically, in elementary particle physics, the way you get to high energies is you collide things head on. You either get something running a down a linear accelerator, or you put them into a synchrotron, a circular accelerator, you collide them head on, and you can only get out as much energy as you can put in in an individual particle. So how energetic can you make a particle? In electron-positron collisions, 
Actually, the record is 208 GeV in the center of mass, so producing particles uh, up to 104 GeV, maybe not quite that. Um, to go beyond that, one actually needs a new technology that hasn't been tried before. And there are some projects for that that we can talk about, but we're going to go in another direction. Protons are easy to accelerate, but unfortunately you have to accelerate them more. Because a proton, as you guys know, is not an elementary particle. It's a big bag of quarks and gluons. If you collide two protons, a quark or a gluon will typically have only one-tenth of the energy of the proton. And so to make particles of 200 GeV, you should collide protons at an energy of 2,000 GeV or more. And so that's basically the goal of the LHC, to collide protons today at um, energies of 3,500 GeV, eventually 7,000 GeV, to try and produce the most, the heaviest, the most energetic particles that one can in that setting. Um, there's no way to make a small machine that does this. <laughs> okay? There's just a law of electromagnetism that tells you if you have a relativistic particle in a magnetic field, the bending is 300 MeV per Tesla meter. So if you want to confine a particle to a ring and its energy is 10,000 GeV, 10 TeV, that ring must be 21 kilometers in circumference. If you want to make a collision and 1,000 GeV particles come out and you'd like to momentum analyze them, well, if you have a one Tesla field, that's a deflection of 1.5 millimeters at 10 meters. So you need a detector that's the size of a house. And if you want to try and use total absorption calorimeter instead of magnetic bending to do this, you get similar sizes. So we're talking about enormous machines, enormous detectors, uh, more or less a good fraction of all of the resources in the global high energy physics community to make this happen. And so the people at CERN have been able to do this, to coordinate efforts literally around the globe to put together these huge instruments. And so now let's start talking about them. So here's a map of the LHC, rather a diagram of what that looks like underground. Uh, down here is like Geneva, we're kind of looking south. Here's the CERN laboratory. If you go across the street from the CERN laboratory, that's the housing of the Atlas detector, which lives maybe 100 meters underground there. If you then go over to the other side of the ring, which by the way is in another country, you have to cross the Swiss-French Swiss border to get there and go a couple hundred meters underground, you come to the CMS detector. There are two other more specialized detectors there, but mainly I'm going to talk about these two in this talk, Atlas and CMS. Here's the photograph that I showed you before of what the LHC tunnel looks like. These are cryostats for superconducting magnets. The LHC has, among other things, the world's largest cryogenic system. This 27-kilometer tunnel is filled with a cryogenic system that maintain superconducting magnets at about two degrees above absolute zero all the time. Um, here's a diagram of the Atlas detector. So this looks very much like that SLD detector that I showed you before. Maybe the main difference is that these are now the people. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is, is really, it's in a cavern that is 10 stories high that, that could accommodate almost every building in Silicon Valley. Could, any individual building in Silicon Valley could be inside that cavern with room to spare. Um, the layout is more or less what I showed you for the SLD. Uh, a precision silicon detector, a tracker, um, an electromagnetic calorimeter. There's a magnet in there to bend a particle so that you can momentum analyze it. Here's the hadron calorimeter. Actually, this thing out here is another magnet. And this is a very cool thing about Atlas. In the inner detector, the magnetic field goes this way. So if you have a charged particle, it gets bent in that plane. The outer magnet is a toroidal magnetic field. So anything that punches all the way through, it pretty much has to be a muon, that gets out to the outer reaches of this, gets bent in an orthogonal plane. 
So the low energy muons get bent this way. The high energy muons get an additional measurement, which is independent of the first one. And so you have a strategy for getting very good muon momentum measurements over a huge range in energy from GeV to multi-TeV, multi-thousand GeV. To get a little idea of how big this thing is, please look at this piece up here, which is a cryostat for one of the magnets that make the toroidal magnetic field. And then here's a photograph of that thing being delivered at CERN. So that enormous object is this uh, relatively minor piece of the Atlas detector. Uh, here's a picture of Atlas under construction. Maybe you've seen this before. Uh, here's the CMS detector, the one, uh, the competitor, which is on the other side of the ring. Maybe I should say that uh, my colleagues at Slack are collaborators in Atlas. So these are the um, Avis, if you like. But uh, th those guys would probably not like me to say that. Um, the design is somewhat different, but it's very similar. The people are a little bigger. It's only five stories high. Instead of that toroidal magnetic system, what they have is iron, which returns the magnetic flux. So the muons bend one way inside and then the opposite way outside. Again, uh, smoothing the accuracy of the momentum measurement over this huge dynamic range. Um, these, this green thing is the electromagnetic calorimeter. It's made out of a stuff called bismuth tungstate. So those are two elements from the bottom of the periodic table. It's a very beautiful crystal uh, grown in China, I think. It's um, essentially crystals like this, absolutely transparent, looks exactly like glass, and it weighs as much as a lead brick. And what that does is to range out very accurately gamma rays and electrons that come in and provide from the scintillation light a very accurate energy measurement. CMS, as you'll see from the picture, is actually um, made in cylindrical segments. So it was assembled on the surface, and then each of those segments were lowered by crane into the pit and uh, assembled together. When you get it all working, um, here are the kind of pictures that you get. So now you'll recognize these pictures from the first part of the talk. Um, this is a jet. This is another jet. This visualization I'll tell you about in a moment. But then you can start to put together all the elements of this picture to make a physics event. Um, in principle now, um, we can just collect data and look for uh, unusual things. In particular, the things probably that we would most like to look for are things that look like dark matter production. You make something, it decays to a dark matter particle. That would be invisible. Actually, because dark matter particles are individually stable, you have to make them in pairs. So there would be two invisible things. There would be some jets. These would be extremely spectacular events. Here's a, a simulation of one that was done by the CMS group. So we're looking for things that look like this. Um, two jets, an electron, a muon. Actually, because these people, it's a simulation and these people are very um, kind, they also indicated the dark matter particles, which are, whose labels are shown in green. But in the real experiment, that would just be something that you wouldn't see. You'd see an unbalanced momentum flow in the event. So now you just run the experiment and you look for things like this, right? Well, of course, it's not that easy. Well, it's not that easy. And Maybe this unbalanced momentum thing will give you a clue to that. The easiest way to have unbalanced momentum in an event is to have part of your detector not working. <laughs> then you, you'll see things happening over here and you won't see things happening down here. In fact, at the LHC, the problems are much more difficult than that. The total proton-proton interaction cross-section, the thing that measures the probability that two protons interact, is at 100 millibarns, a tenth of this unit of a barn. The typical new particle, sorry, new particle production cross-section is a picobarn. So what that means is that you're looking for things that happen at a rate of 10 to the minus 11 or smaller of the total rate for proton-proton collisions. So in a factor of 100 billion, there's lots of opportunities for error. 
And you have to be very, very sure that those things are not happening if you're going to claim the discovery of new physics, even uh, to identify physics which is already well understood. So the next thing we have to do is to sort through the various layers of what has to be understood to do these experiments. So I've made a list of them here. We first have to figure out how to look at all the data. So the proton collisions are occurring at the rate of 20 million per second. Um, that has to go off to some farm somewhere and we have to be able to understand uh, what's in that data um, even, to make, even to do anything with it. Then most of these events come from ordinary quark and gluon interactions. So we have to peel those off first. Then we have to, maybe by that time you've gotten through the first factor of a million in this hundred billion that you need to understand. Then we need to understand rare quark-gluon interactions with large energy deposition or many jets. Identify those and peel them off. Then there are other standard model reactions that give things that look like dark matter, leptons, unbalanced momentum, etc. We should understand those and then once we've understood everything in this list, we have to see whether anything is left over. <coughs> and so this is a program that um, with a, maybe I should say, a huge amount of work, you can actually carry out. And here are some scenes from it. First of all, the data flow. Atlas and CMS are seeing 20 million proton-proton bunch collisions per second. Um, you would have the capability of recording roughly 100 events per second to permanent storage where you can analyze it. You'd better pick the right 100, otherwise it's as if you didn't do the experiment. So what is done is the data is sent to a computer farm, to a pipeline. Um, you analyze pieces of these events in turn. You have in Atlas three stages to this computer <coughs> system which is called the trigger. At each stage, you reject 99 events in 100 of what's coming through and you throw away everything else. And then you do more sophisticated processing. You throw away another 99 in 100. Then more sophisticated processing, processing you throw away another 99 in 100. Now you're down to the level where you can store the data. When you store 100 events per second, you're building a database which is 10 petabytes a year. So that's basically what sets the limit. Um, someone told me that if you were to record every LHC event on CDs, you would need more than the world production of CDs to do it. So the levels work like this. The first level is actually, um, they're uh, basically hard-coded chips and they have to operate in 100 microseconds. They look for large energy deposition and muons. The next level is programmable and you can look for things like missing energy, heavy quarks, tau leptons. You get a whole 10 milliseconds to make that decision. Then you send it to something that does a kind of reconstruction of the whole event. You get a whole second and after that, um, at each stage, as I say, 99% uh, of the events are thrown away and once it's thrown away, it's gone. So enormous effort goes into making sure that these decisions not only are done correctly, but they're done in some redundant way so that you can calibrate what signals you're missing at every stage. Um, here's just a little picture of the CMS level one trigger in action. Um, next we have to get rid of the events that are ordinary. The events that look like just a quark hitting a quark or a quark hitting a gluon. And a very nice way to do this is something called the Lego plot. So let's imagine an event with tracks coming out of it like that. And I can view this in the following way. I have my coordinate theta, this angle, phi, the azimuthal angle. Think about the tracks coming out along rays. Take the event and unroll it. So I have a plane of phi and theta. And then what I want to plot is for each track or energy deposition, I'll plot a tower given by the momentum in the direction transverse to the beam direction. So if something is going along the beam direction, no matter how fast it's going, it'll be a short tower. That basically would be what would happen if two protons just disrupted each other 
and all the quarks and gluons came spilling out with no large momentum transfer. If I have a hard collision between a quark and a quark, and they go out at large angles, I give it a large transverse momentum, and then that would appear as a large tower. So here are some sample events, actually not from the LHC, but from Fermilab that illustrate this point. Here's event one, here's event two. It's hard to tell the difference. But event one, if you make the Lego plot, it looks like this. It's basically noise. This number here is 10 GeV. These towers are only a few GeV of transverse momentum. This is what it looks like when nothing interesting happens, when the bags are just disrupted and everything goes flying forward. The second event, if you make the same plot, it looks like this. And this is now what a jet looks like on the Lego plot. A large concentration of mainly pions that are collimated in a certain direction, the whole thing having a very large transverse momentum. So whatever this thing was, probably a quark hitting an antiquark, it got a large transverse kick. And so this is very clearly a quark-antiquark scattering with a large momentum transfer. Now the trick of the trigger is to throw away the first kind of event, and by the way, also to throw away this kind of event. <laughs> because this is just the ordinary strong interactions, and we're interested in something that's more complicated. You keep a certain number of these two jet events, and I'll show you a couple more of them. They're, they're actually quite beautiful. So here's uh, observed in CMS, a two jet event. Here's the Lego plot. You see the two jets very clearly. But there are also more complicated events. Oh, by the way, here is the, um, I think as of the middle of last year, the highest jet-jet uh, mass that had been observed. So if you add up the, the momenta in these two jets, that object has a mass of 4 TeV. And actually, you're only putting in 7 TeV. So it's all coming out in this quark-quark scattering. Um, here's a very interesting event with eight jets. Here's the Lego plot. You can see a large number of towers. However, in our theory of strong interactions, QCD, when you have a quark-quark scatter, you can radiate gluons. And some fraction of the time, this happens. So actually, uh, what I show in the inset is the simulation of how many jets you should expect in quark-quark scattering. And when you get to 10 to the minus 5 of the total cross-section, you expect events with 10 or more jets. So just having a large number of jets or the event being very interesting isn't enough. We need some better signals than that. By the way, I told you missing momentum was very tricky. You have to make sure that the detector is working or know how to interpret the signals from the parts that are not working quite up to par. This is a slide from CMS that compares the missing momentum that you would observe with the raw data to after you go through and figure out basically which pixels are turned on and which ones are turned off, which ones are noisy, you take them out, you correct for it. The final result has a, actually a very good missing momentum resolution. So now we can really look for neutrinos and also dark matter particles that are in the data. And now we come to what should eventually be, actually what are already the dominant sources of background to new particle production. The fact that in the standard model, there are heavy particles, the Ws and the Zs, and actually also the top quarks, um, which decay to neutrinos, leptons, uh, missing energy, many jets, and which have cross-sections which are 1,000 to 10,000 times what you would expect for the exotic things we're looking for. And um, those, really, you just have to understand how these reactions work design searches that kind of work around them or eliminate them, and hope that something will stick out from under these hopefully well understood background processes. So um, let me just go ahead now and show you some of the results from the early stages of the LHC. We're still at the beginning of this program. We're in the third year of running of the LHC. Um, probably we've seen now 1% of the total LHC data set. Um, there's no new physics yet, but there's a lot of interesting things, so I'll just show you some snapshots of that. So first of all, W and Z bosons. The W and Z bosons are the basic quanta that produce beta decay. So just like 
a W and Z coming out of a nucleus will produce an electron in the neutrino. A W that you make in the laboratory can make an electron and a muon and the neutrino. A Z can make a pair of electrons or a pair of muons. And you can find events where these things are seen very clearly. Here's a very beautiful CMS event. This very straight track here is a very energetic electron. Here's the electromagnetic calorimeter signal. You see it's very large. On the other side, there's nothing. We infer that there's a neutrino there. And actually, you can estimate the mass of the parent at 71 GeV. Given that it's hard to measure the neutrino, this is plenty close enough to the mass of the W to be a good W candidate. Here's a similar event from ATLAS. Um, the straight track and the electromagnetic signal. Um, the, uh, those red dots actually are an indication that this is an electron rather than a pion. Uh, in a diagnostic in the detector. Here's a, a, an event from Atlas with uh, two electrons. And actually, you can add up the mass. It turns out to be within two GeV of the known mass of the Z boson. So this is almost certainly uh, direct Z production. And here's an event from CMS with two muons, which make it all the way out through all that iron. And so we understand that they're muons. Um, the mass is, again, within two GeV of the mass of the Z. Here's, by the way, a Z to tau tau. Remember I told you at the beginning of the lecture that you could identify a tau by a one track against three track topology. So you can actually see it here. Um, one track over here, which is a muon, three pions here in a very narrow cluster, uh, making a Z boson with that uh, relatively uncommon decay. We can also find events with top quark production. Now, the top quark was discovered in 1995. It really was one of the hardest things to discover in particle physics. It was discovered at the Fermilab Tevatron. Its fraction of the cross section there is 10 to the minus 11. So one, one actually can see things at that small level. Um, here are some very beautiful top quark events from the LHC. So this one is, um, the top quark, by the way, decays to a bottom quark and a W. So you're looking for, for example, the lepton and the neutrino plus one of these jets that's tagged with a secondary vertex. Um, here's an example from CMS. Um, there's an electron in this event over here and four jets, uh, at least one of which, no, two of which have B tags in them, although they're not visible in this picture. Um, here's a very beautiful picture from Atlas with an electron over here, a muon punching through the whole outer system over here. Here's a blow up of the interaction region, and you see the secondary vertices here and here. So all the things that you would expect in a top quark event. Um, here's a very interesting event from Atlas, which is basically the base of the Lego plot for an event, which is a top quark candidate. The top quark is supposed to decay to a bottom quark and a W, the W making two jets. So what you should see if you have a very boosted top quark is three jets in a narrow region summing up to the mass of the top quark. And that's actually seen here. This particular jet has a vertex in it, so it's B-tagged. On the other side, an electron and another jet, so this thing is a good candidate for the anti-top. One measures the rate of top quark production, and it turns out to be hugely higher than what was seen at Fermilab. In fact, 25 times higher for a step in energy of only three and a half. So how is that possible? Well, actually, it's even the prediction of the standard model. As you make the protons more and more energetic, two things happen. First of all, the lower energy pieces now get boosted, so they have enough energy to make the heavy top quark. Secondly, at the Tevatron, you could only make top quarks from the very fastest pieces of the proton. So they would be quarks and antiquarks. At the LHC, you can make top quarks out of the gluons in the proton. And it turns out that the gluon cross-section to make top quarks is about five times larger than the cross-section for making top quarks out of a quark and an antiquark. And so those two things coming together explain this enormous rise. Of course, 
Unfortunately, to find something beyond the top quark, it's actually a problem. Because the thing that was a great discovery in 1995 now becomes the background to finding the next thing. So I can tell you a little about the search for the Higgs boson, but maybe the bottom line is that it hasn't been found yet. Um, the Higgs boson, though, I can show you some events that look like Higgs bosons. The Higgs is supposed to decay to a pair of W bosons, a pair of Z bosons, or a pair of photons. And events in all those categories have been seen. Um, here's a very beautiful event with two Zs in it, uh, a, an electron pair here and a quark pair here, summing to the right mass. Um, Here's another ZZ event. One of the Zs is invisible, but you can infer its existence from the unbalanced nature of the event. Um, here is a very beautiful event where you have a pair of muons and then a pair of electrons, each of which would make a Z. The total mass would be, um, you can actually, you've seen all the particles, you can compute it, 124 GeV. Actually, there's a little cluster of these events near 125 that people think might be the first sign of the Higgs boson. Um, you can also see the Higgs in its decay to two photons. So you see such an event here. No track, but an electromagnetic deposition. Here's the Lego plot. That's a, those are photons. If you add up the momentum vectors of those photons, you can infer the mass. And if you plot it out, you can see there's a little glitch here that has people very excited. But frankly, the, ev the probability that that just came from pure chance, um, one in a hundred or something like that. So in science, you wait until you've really seen it. Um, nevertheless, one, of, one has seen some events that might be consistent with the Higgs boson. This year, we're going to get four times more data. So we'll see if these signals actually can become strong enough that we can say that at least we've reached this milestone of getting into the territory where we're exploring these mysteries. Finally, we can look for events with many jets and missing momentum characteristic of dark matter production. Unfortunately, now all the searches look like this. Um, a large signal that you can see with several jets and unbalanced momentum explanations for all those signals. So you can see that um, some of those, the, the green is the prediction for top, the uh, b dark blue is the prediction for making a Z boson and having the Z boson decay to neutrinos, and by the way, emitting some gluons along the way. Um, the light blue is the prediction for what should come from W bosons. When you add it all up, you explain the signal and maybe there's one event out on the tail, which is very tantalizing. But once again, as we get more data, we'll be able to search out here more and more uh, significantly, and we can hope that something will turn up. Um, there's some very beautiful analysis methods that have been applied to this. Um, let me not go into them uh, in great detail. I'll just show you this event, which frankly, looks an awful lot like that CMS simulation event that I showed you about half an hour ago. Um, two prominent jets, uh, missing energy along this vector and a rather large amount. Um, it's a perfect candidate for the production of dark matter. But um, as the late lamented uh, Maurice Goldhaber said, you can have as many candidates as you want, but not all candidates get elected. And that's where we are in the LHC right now. Um, a very good understanding of what we're seeing. Uh, no signs yet except these little glimmers of the Higgs boson of new physics beyond what's known yet. A lot of territory yet to explore. And now that the thing is up and running, a lot of time to do it. And I think I can just hope that you folks will wish us luck for the future. And we'll see what we can find. Thank you very much. Michael, if I can kick up the questions. I'm, I'm struck by how much uh, the search for the, uh, the Higgs is like the search for the SETI signal. Uh, <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it true that the, the way to investigate these events that you've shown us mm -hmm. is to look for more in, in, in upcoming data? How, how are you going to eventually reassure yourselves that what you're seeing here is the Higgs boson? 
Well, let's see. I mean, the Higgs is not, it, it had, there's one important difference from the SETI signal, which is that we actually know what we're looking for. Um, we're not just looking for an anomaly. Um, the Higgs decays to specific decay channels with, as predicted, specific branching ratios, specific fractions. So in principle, if it were really there, if, if this were to turn into the real discovery of the Higgs boson, we would see a, a single prominent peak in the two photon distribution. We would see a cluster of events in ZZ around a certain mass. We would also see in um, the W signal a certain um, anomalous large value for the WW cross-section in a certain region. Um, this, the Higgs also decays to uh, bottom quarks, although that's harder to see. Eventually, that would be observed as well. And so all these signals would not only be there, but they would all have to be consistent with a single object of the same mass. And so with, uh, you know, 10 times the data sample that we have now, all of those things in principle should fall into place if the particle is actually there. If it's not there, um, then, well, there's still the mystery that I explained in the first half of the lecture of where the masses of W, Zs, quarks, and leptons come from. Um, in quantum theory, it all, always comes from a particle. So you have to find that particle. But for the moment, I think um, the idea that it comes from some particle with this particular signature is not unreasonable. And already this year, we should make enormous progress toward finding out whether all those things fall into place. OK, sir. It's basically the same question, but um, I, I you know, what you're saying is almost a little bit in contradiction of what I was hearing with news reports in terms of, you know, getting sigma, um, you know, out to six sigma and certainty of finding this uh, particle. And I was wondering if you could just um, expand on your answer in, in those terms. Well, um, you know, sometimes my colleagues oversimplify a little. So they say if it's five sigma, it's a discovery. But I think in, in physics, phenomena are richer than that. Um, things have multiple signals, and you would like to not only have a discovery, but you would like to have a confirmation. And so you would like to see a very prominent peak. That would tell you something. You'd like to see the same particle viewed in other reactions. That's your confirmation that, um, you know, it's not just noise or some accident or some mismeasurement. Of course, at the LHC, there are also two... Uh, different experimental groups, which are hot competitors to each other, that are trying to dig the signal out. So, um, you know, there are many examples in particle physics where the first one comes out and says it's a signal, and the next one comes out and says, well, in, in our data, there's a dip. And so, if, uh, if both collaborations come out with signals that look very similar, that will also give us confidence that this is a real effect. I showed you the detectors are quite different. So um, there's, there's some complementarity in these two measurements. So, you know, we'll see. It's way too early to claim anything now, and one just has to wait. And, you know, in science, as you accumulate data, things really do become clearer. I mean, either they become clearer or people cease to believe them. And so with much data being accumulated this year and in the future, we'll see which one happens. Please. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, um, it's, it's just such an amazing accomplishment, and it's uh, incredible what has been done, as you've described. Um, but um, I remember in one of Feynman's lectures, I think the Messenger lectures or something, you talked about uh, the end of physics will be either things are figured out, a final theory, or it'll become too resource demanding to go any further. And there can never be another collider, <laughs> ever. So you find the Higgs, or you don't. You find some other stuff. And then you have an infinite amount of energy to go, and you know where to get there. What, what, what is the future? Well, I mean, that, that's a problem that concerns me. But, um, and I think, you know, th this machine is something that costs of order $10 billion. 
that's more or less the limit of what the world can put forward for uh, something that's a pure science project like this. So you have to figure out how are you going to get to higher energies or to at least some different perspective on things. Um, you know, I think, I think unfortunately substantially cheaper is, is not in the offing, but maybe you can figure out how to get well beyond the capabilities of this machine without it costing more than this machine. I mean, that's the challenge for us. So there are various things one can look at there. Uh, one thing to look at is to try and look at this same energy regime in electron-positron collisions. So there, um, electron-positron collisions at least don't have the problem of this 10 to the minus 11. The all reactions, new and exotic, take place at roughly the same rates. And so some things are much clearer. You can't, if you don't go to higher energy, you can't produce more particles, new particles, than what's done at the LHC. But the particles that you've discovered at the LHC, um, maybe even the Higgs boson if it shows up, uh, you could study in much more detail. And so you can learn much more about them. So you take a fuzzy picture and you sharpen it. Um, yeah, if you could give me $10 billion, I can tell you how to do that. <laughs> the other option is to try and invent new ways of accelerating particles so that you can actually go to much higher energies. And so actually at SLAC, um, there's some interesting initiatives there. Um, there's a group that um, takes a, uh, basically a tank that contains a very diffuse plasma, <coughs> and you shoot an electron beam through it. And it sets up a plasma wave in this plasma. And those waves have very strong electric fields that can accelerate particles. And they've done an experiment. This is a SLAC, USC, UCLA group where they take a bunch of electrons and they chop off a little piece in the back end. And they send the first part through and it sets up one of these plasma waves. And the next part goes through and it surfs on the plasma waves and gains energy. Now, SLAC, you remember, is three, is, uh, three kilometers long and it gets an energy gain of 50 GeV. This device is one meter long and it gets it got an energy gain of 46 GeV. <laughs> okay? So if you could have, now, that's just one of them, right? In order to get to TeV energies, you need, um, what did I say, 20 of them working in sequence, and you have to be able to pass beam from one to the other without blowing it up and destroying it. Um, there are other things that you have to study, but we have a research program now to try to see whether you can get from this experiment to something that would actually be an elementary particle accelerator. Actually, there's another group at our place that's playing with um, essentially a, a nanoscale device that you shine a laser into. And um, by reflecting the laser light off the walls, you can make an accelerating field. And that might be another technology to get us to um, you know, tens of GeV per meter accelerators that we can actually afford to go beyond this energy range. Um, it's going to be a long time in the future, but as I've shown you, this thing had to start a long time in the past to be where we are now. And you just have to have a, I guess, a coherent attitude in the community that that's a goal that you have to pursue. And we'll see if we can get there. Okay, please. Dr. Peskin, uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. I have two questions and a bet. Could you pass this forward, please? Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you. The first question is, uh, to what early universe time does the LHC energies correspond, or are they even in the range? Sorry? Uh, uh. To what early universe time does the LHC energies correspond? Like what's, what's, yeah, um, uh, oh, yeah, so what's It's about 10 to the minus, um, it, it's about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Hmm. Thank you. But, um, you know, the time after the Big Bang, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, the, at Stanford, we once had a course on cosmology. And there was the early universe cosmology given by Andre Linde, whom you probably know, the, one of the inventors of inflation, inflationary cosmology. 
And then there was the after the early universe cosmology. And the joke was that Andre was taking everything up to 10 to the minus 20 seconds. And then the other professor was taking everything from there to the present. The second question is, please, does the quark expansion of the protons increase the interaction cross-section enough to be significant? Um, well, actually, it's known that the proton-proton cross-section increases slowly at high energy, like a power of the logarithm of the energy. So this is a known phenomena. The cross-section, the proton-proton cross-section is larger at the LHC than was observed at Fermilab. We have data from cosmic rays that it keeps going up. Um, this is under, is, it's, I won't say it's a completely understood phenomena, but there are very reasonable models that explain it. It's not a big effect. And unfortunately for us, the much more important effect is that if you want to make something that is a very heavy particle, the cross-section goes down because basically the thing is smaller so to, to get all that energy into the small region that you need, the cross-section goes down like 1 over the energy squared. So we not only need higher energy, but we also need higher what's called luminosity, brighter and brighter beams that we're squeezing smaller and smaller to collide with one another. So in these uh, electron-positron experiments of the next generation, the beams are going to be uh, a tenth of a micron by a nanometer. And people... People claim that they, that they know how to do that. In fact, we did some experiments at Slack to prove that you can actually get a beam that small. Okay, well... Um, oh, and um, let's see, I think, I think I'm not going to take your money, but in the theory group, we have a bet book. So if you send me an email with the bet, I will write it in the bet book, and if you win, I will pay you off, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And if you Google me, you can find my email address. Okay, well, um, for, for those who are uh, interested in talking one-on-one -on -one with Michael, he'll be around for a couple of minutes after this, so uh, I encourage you to, uh, to come up and chat to him. Michael, we have a special oh. Are We Alone? Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll find SETI and Very the Higgs boson well, at the, about the same time. Well, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Please join me in thanking Michael for his great time.